Hi, Joel. It's Thanks. I so much for that, Jordan. Um, and um, over to you, John. Thank you. Hi, afternoon, everybody. Uh, sorry to keep you waiting. Um, welcome to um, this week's Ask the Exec. Um, sorry, whenever I start, I get a load of messages saying, I'll just dismiss that, right? Um, you're very welcome. Uh, here's to a, um, another good conversation. Thank you for joining and taking the time. Um, as ever, just go through some if people could switch their mics off, get some feedback. Um, that's the yeah. So I'll do a, a quick summary of where we've got to, and um, then we'll go into the the Q and A. So first things first, I think hopefully we're all feeling a bit buoyed by the sort of national news, both in terms of the route out of lockdown. Um, as at least given us something to um, calendar dates to, to to pin our hopes and optimism on, and um, allied to that are the, are the reducing um, infection rates, um, admissions, um, and deaths nationally, which is um, really good to see. Um, and I think you're all familiar with the charts that that are on the news and in the media. Um, and likewise, we're, we're seeing you know, very similar um, numbers across the county, um, particularly in our, our acute hospitals. So um, still um, more activity than ordinary this time of year, still very busy, but certainly going in the right direction. Um, closer to home, um, we're, we're doing some great work. The, um, the outbreaks number, I think from this morning, Amory was, uh, we're, we're officially down to 10. And um, so the number is reducing overall, but we are still having fresh outbreaks. And um, so again, it's, um, despite the optimism, um, the good news, the, um, the, the emerging better picture, there's still this ask to make sure that we continue to support all our colleagues in, use of PPE, social distancing, and all that infection prevention control stuff, which is vitally important. And we've just got to keep that message and keep supporting everybody to, to being able to do that. Um, we, we mustn't lose sight of that yet. Um, you don't need me to say, it's evident, isn't it? Because if, if you do get an, if we do get an outbreak on a, on, in, in, a in a clinical team or, or any team really, that the implications are, are really challenging to manage. Um, more positive news on vaccination program. Again, you'll you'll see nationally that um, the the cohorts one to four, the most vulnerable um, people in the population of, of uh, those targets were, were reached. Um, I think we're way over 17 million nationally now, and we're about to hit 300,000 for the county. Um, we we the, the the county program that um, we're we're sort of coordinating organization for on behalf of the ICS and as I think is really starting to get into its stride. So we were the top performing um, ICS nationally um, for the latest cohort, which is the 65 to 69 year olds, um, which is a tremendous achievement. Again, more close to home, we've now vaccinated over 7,300 staff, um, having had their first doses, which is brilliant. Um, there's obviously still more to do, more staff to get vaccinated and again put the word out. Um, slots are available, vaccine is available um, and people will be able to um, avail themselves of it. It's not too late and it's really important that um, we make sure that um, all our staff have access to that and we're doing some focus work around some of the more vulnerable groups um, including um, the BME um, staff and clinically vulnerable um, to make sure that, um, that they can access that too. Um, in terms of vaccinating our patients, we're working through um, inpatients um, to, to make sure that we cover across all the different sites um, and that's work in progress. I think that we've roughly done 
460 plus um, inpatients at the moment. Um, you, you'll appreciate this, there's some quite challenging logistics because that's not a fixed population as people get admitted and discharged. And we may need to just need to make sure that from a process point of view, we, we, we make sure those people are tracked and followed up to, to get their second doses. Um, but again, um, th that's a really good place to be. And there's work going on in the current cohort, how we enable people with um, who are clinically vulnerable, which is uh, a large majority of our um, community and day patients um, are also enabled to get access um, right across our services. So um, it will be, it'll be a really good place to be to when we've got that cohort vaccinated to put that layer of protection in for them. So that's really good progress. Um, I just wanted to, to finish on a couple of things. One is to start to introduce the um, conversation around and um, we won't just be talking about COVID and vaccinations for the future because um, you all know that um, the rest of the world continues and, and the organisation continues to run. Um, but we'll see that whilst we are still in this um, command and control situation in the NHS that I think very, very quickly, despite some of the rhetoric about time for recuperation and recovery, there'll be demands for, and there already are um, demands coming in to get our strategic plans, our financial plans in, our efficiency plans um, our, and all that sort of stuff that will start to get back into um, I, I guess what you term business as usual. So we need to make sure again that we that we support all our staff in making that transition and that we don't lose sight of the really important point about um, many, many staff have gone so far above and beyond and knackered um, that we find time for to encourage people to have leave and a time find time to recuperate and support them in a broad tranche of of well-being support because um, when the adrenaline um, washes away and the pandemic is behind us, we'll be in different um, territory psychologically. And it's really important that um, that, that, that us as senior leaders in the organisation support um, that transition back into um, let, let's call it um, normal operations. So that's that's going to come into sharp focus quite soon. Um, and then last thing for me, Alex, for now, by, by way of introduction, it, it, it's just as, it's again to reiterate, uh, thanks to everybody for, for what they continue to do. Um, despite everything, the organisation remains in pretty good shape. Um, there, there are always things that need some extra focus and sorting out, but um, my thanks to everybody that's been involved um, in what they're doing um, to get us through this. Uh, and please pass that, that on to your colleagues too. Um, so that's that's it for me, Alex. For starters, back to you, uh, and then we'll go. We'll start to go through some of the the Q and A. Excellent. Thanks so, so much, John. So just to um, let you know that there's a question from um, Kumar, which has been put in the chat, which Anne Maria has advised on, but just for the recording. Um, from Leicester, some of our staff have had their first dose in King's Mill. Can they leave their second dose in? Can they have their second dose in Leicester, the Pfizer vaccine, if available? This will save two hours travel time for my staff. Please help. And Maria has put um, Kumar, we will find out from our team here. Um, I don't know if you wish to add anything either, either of you. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's important for us to, to find that out. The, the, um, there, there is a risk that if, if we, uh, I take the point Kumar about saving time, but there is a risk of going to different centres that we lose track and it introduces the, the possibility of error um that's not huge whilst there's only two vaccines but it you know once there's three four five around it it, it could be quite challenging so um rather than um be specific here let's find out what um the actual advice is yeah that's a good call excellent thank you um and natasha bowen has asked is there an error with the second dose appointment change I know that I saw something on Facebook about this with regards to um, changing the changing the date so that there was a four month gap. Um, yeah. I don't know Alex, if that's you're referring Alex, to. Somewhere in, 
Yeah, Alex, let, uh, San Maria, let me just answer that. So, Natasha, it's a really good question. Um, so what happened is, is that um, before we had national guidance, we had already made appointments for the second dose to be with the, either three or four weeks later. So um, the national guidance then um, enabled us to change those second appointments. Now, what I would say to you is, is what I have seen on the closed Facebook page is that some people's second appointment has been put back twice or even three times and is much longer than the recommended 12 weeks. So if that is the case, if your second appointment is longer than 12 weeks, then yes, absolutely, you should get in touch with the um, uh, COVID vaccine um, uh, email that we've got on Connect or um, the phone number that's on Connect. So if it's longer than 12 weeks, get in touch. If it's less than 12 weeks, stick to the appointment that you have been given for your second dose. I hope that answers it. Excellent. Thanks ever so much, Anne Maria. That's great. Um, there's a question which was um, also um, on Facebook, but I thought it would be good to to share here as well, um, which is whether an unqualified colleague can undertake nurse training whilst working part time. Um, and it's just, you know, can you just advise on what people's options are for nurse training? And Anne Maria, as you're there, yeah. I wondered if you wanted to answer yeah, that, please. Yeah, I'll take that. I'll take that. Thank you so much, Alex. Yeah, really good question. I'm not sure who posed it, but um, thank you for that. So the long and short of it is yes, but let me just expand a little bit for you. So uh, we have um, the Open University it offers a part time four year route into nursing registration. We actually already have staff that access that um, and they can do that across all three fields of nursing. So that's mental health nursing, adult nursing and midwifery. So that is available and we have people who are doing that. Um, for staff who've already got a de degree, you can access um, a graduate entry nursing route and that takes two years, but that is full time. Um, and these options are um, put through the apprenticeship route. Um, so that means that your tuition fees are paid from the apprentice levy funds, but the staff do, do need to be employed in the clinical area um, so that they can meet the nursing competencies and the skills of the programme. Um, as identified in the NMC um, Nursing and Midwifery Council standards. Um, so all the above options that I've just um, described, you need to be employed by us for at least 30 hours per week to be able to complete the programmes. Um, but we do recognise that lots of people have queried this around uh, being able to do their nurse training. So Deb Boyer um, and some colleagues are putting are hosting um, an information session for staff and managers to find out more about the OU offer. And that's on the 13th of April, uh, 10 a.m. And also on the Tuesday, the 20th of April at 2 p.m. But we will make sure that um, that information gets out. It's currently, um, the details are on Connect and you can find out all that information. If you do want more, you can also get in touch with Deb Boyer, who's the practice development manager as well. That's great. Thanks ever so much, Anne Maria. Um, and I noticed that Julie Atfield has joined us as well. So hi, Julie. So, <laughs> um, just um, another question that's been been asked, um, and I wonder if you want to take this, John. Um, um, which is uh, when will the staff survey results be released? Well, I know they're currently under embargo, aren't they, John? <laughs> I think you put this in just to get me to, to break the rules and tell everybody how well we've done, Alex. Um, the um, the staff, National Staff Survey results will be on the 11th of March at 9.30 a.m. and we will share our, our results more widely after that date. That's the formal answer. Do you want to go on to question three? No. So let me tell you a bit more about this then because um, when I started here just over a couple of years ago, um, one, of, one of my um, pitches was that there are, I think there are three headline outputs that can tell you how well the trust is doing. Um, the one is the external independent input from CQC. 
Um, we can't do anything about those ratings at the moment. Uh, well, we, we can do, we can do the work, but those ratings aren't going to change until they're able to come back and um, do a, a core inspection. And the second one is the National Staff Survey. Um, that is so important because it's about what all our people um, are saying about us. Um, and as people will know, over the last four or five years, those results have generally slipped each year. The third one um, is perhaps more technical and relates to some of the performance data around um, key performance indicators and related things, and that's all, all goes to board and is all fine. But for me, this is um, this is of fundamental importance. Um, and, and one of the, the headline ways that you can tell how you're doing is, is, is purely just on the response rate. Um, and I can tell you this um, without getting into trouble. So our, our response rate has gone up from 44 to 55 and a half percent in one year. So a, a nearly, an increase of nearly 11 percent, which is a, an amazing um, achievement in itself um, and, and speaks to how well um, engaged staff are feeling. And the, there actually is quite a strong correlation between um, your response rate and the, the positive commentary. Um, so some of the top performing um, organisations get into the mid 60s um, in terms of response rate. So that's our target. And that gives you a sense of, um, you know, two years ago, I think it was 39 for us. Um, but within that, um, I'm, I'm not averse to sharing. We have done we have done well, um, and we started to turn the tank around. And um, people will remember perhaps some of the the headline domains that um, it reports on um, in terms of morale, engagement, um, ED and I. Um, I can't remember. There's eight or nine of them, and we've we've come up in all of those domains. Um, quite significantly. Um, so it's been a tremendous achievement in terms of compared to previously, um, compared to our own performance previously. Um, that there, there will the the sort of the other headline that that sort of goes along with that. Um, it brings us back to average, um, which is a sense of how far off it we were. Um, to have this sort of improvement. Some, some of the categories have gone up um, in double digit percent improvements, but it's only brought us back to average overall. Um, so I, to me, that's, I mean, it doesn't take anything away. Um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sort of an indication of some of the challenges we've had to face, um, but it puts us on a really firm footing for the next few years and looking ahead, if we can continue to do the sorts of things we're doing and keep developing um, our culture, our values, um, you know, our behaviours, our, our ability to take feedback, to reflect, to, to work compassionately with each other, we'll, we'll get to the top of the charts. And that's not just, you know, to get to the top of the charts, because that means then we're doing the right things for our patients and service users, and we're doing the right things for all our staff. Um, so, um, yeah, that's a um, look forward to that date. Um, we're, we're working um, with the comms team and, and with all the divisions to to get some headlines out and we really start to, to focus on some of the you said together we did which will start to pick up some threads around some of the long-standing challenges that have uh, that have been well documented in the free text that people have put into the into the survey and and that's it's that's always really rich in terms of um, the content of that so th that's um quite a a detailed answer I'm hope, um, hopefully conveying that the sense of importance of this and although it's embargoed and um, you know it, this is we need to start to have a conversation about this across the organization because it's so important I don't know whether um, uh, Amory or Julie want to add anything um, in, in terms of national staff survey I don't mind if you do um, and I don't mind if you'd rather not because of the embargo <laughs> I, I would like to add something. Um, uh, John's quite right. I think it's a really very good indicator of how we're doing. It's a real sense check. Um, 
However, one of the more important things is, is that how we then respond to staff in, in as much as what you said we did. So it's not just a, a one off tick box or a one off um, conversation. It's it very much is what we then do with the information post um, having that. And I also wanted to just reiterate that the CQC do pay a lot of attention to our staff survey results and um, they always have done. Um, it plays quite a, an important part of how they feel sat staff uh, are able to say what they want to say. Um, it also formulates towards something called closed cultures, which is something the CQC are very, very interested in. And it's something that we do want to, as an organisation, really delve into what does that mean for us? Do people feel that they can say something to their either their direct line managers or other people within the organisation, or do people feel that they've got to go outside the organisation to say something? These all contribute to how it feels to be on the receiving end of this organisation and how it feels to be on the receiving end of um, all of the people that they work with um, and uh, the, the, the sense of this organisation. So I just wanted to say that it actually contributes to lots of things, but it's not a one off exercise. It's important that we do something with it, but also the fact that the external world, world do look at it as well. Julie, did you want to say something? Yeah, so without not saying too much, because I'll get into trouble because it's embargoed like like our chief executive. So um, I think the survey um, findings are something that um, we're going to be pleased to share across our services. I think as well, um, it's, it gives us a lot of additional intelligence to look at specific areas and where we have got some variability. So. I think it, it gives us a chance to to restart as well those conversations that after you know some really difficult times um, continuing to operate services. The thing that I've seen from the information that I have seen is it, it really reaffirms some of what we know we want our priorities to, to be working on in the future. So things like um, the quality of managerial supervision relationships and um, things like tackling racism, it, it really does help us hone um, where we might be going as an organisation and, and as individual teams and leaders on some of those issues. So I think we'll be able to talk a lot more about that um, over the next few weeks. But, it, it, you know, to actually thank colleagues as well, because I think it will be some positive feedback about the work that has been done. So. Oh, thank you so much, Julie. Just to um, within the within the chat, Anna Simpson um, has asked when the embargo when the embargo is lifted, how long will it be in terms of when we receive the theme scores, or will it be the raw data initially? Yeah, just just to say, I, I've, I've put a bit of a um, cheeky response in. Um, we, we've actually received um, quite a lot of um, already analysed data, so. Um, Anna, it, it won't be, there won't be very much raw stuff that we'll need um, working through. Um, and we, we still got a bit of time to, to work through it further. So we will be able to get down to directorate level findings um, and, and we, we will um, get that released um, with a bit of a, I, I think, a, a launch on, on the day. Brilliant, thank you. And, um, and Catherine has said the gender Identity, gender and sexual orientation steering group met this morning and is really looking forward to the breakdown by protected characteristics. It'll be really helpful to inform our future work plan. And absolutely, I think there's a lot of work and there's so much information and rich information, as you say, that we can work on for all elements across the organisation. So that's great. So, and um, Anne Maria has just um, added into the chat as well for um, in relation to the question from Kumar. Um, we would actively encourage staff to attend their original appointment date, but if they are able to access appointments closer to home and can arrange them, then this is a personal choice. Okay, so thank you ever so much for that. Um, Linked um, also to um, vaccines, there's, uh, sorry, to COVID, there's a question which was uh, which was asked, um, can anyone give me a definitive factual answer as to why BME people are more at risk of getting COVID than non-BME people? 
I don't know who wishes to answer. Um, sh shall I, I take that um, to start with um, Alex? Uh, it's a fantastic question, isn't it? It's, I think it's a really good example. That, um, we sort of work on a, an assumption that, and um, don't ask the fundamental question. Um, so th thank you for um, for raising it. Um, the the short answer is no. Um, that um, that there is. Um, sorry, I, let me start again. Um, people don't know why. Um, and it seems to be full multifaceted. So COVID does have a disproportionate impact on BME communities um, in as much that they have um, poor outcomes um, and increased death rates. That's a fact. The reason for the disproportionate impact is not fully known. Um, and there are a number of um, causal factors, associated factors, attributable factors that um, make um, this population more vulnerable. Um, and it's likely that it's not there for just one thing. And there's there's a whole raft of research that's um, underway to try and ascertain that. Um, there's data to suggest that, um, for example, BME communities are less likely to take up the vaccine offer. Um, and there's evidence suggesting fear, mistrust, um, scaremongering myths are important contributors to that um, and th within our own vaccination program there's um, there's a number of work streams um, ongoing to try and uh, tackle that so for example people may have seen that um, on Eastman today Day the, the, the work going on and um, working with local mosques in the city to um, encourage people to take up um, the vaccine that's going very well we're also working with local community health uh, community uh, and faith organisations um, and we're doing some bespoke sessions um, with our own staff and leads to do some of that myth, myth busting um, to um, encourage people to, to take up the vaccine offer. Um, so uh, great question. Um, there's, there's not a, a simple single answer as to, to why um, that is the case. Uh, thank you all so much. Um, Mark Cowles has got his hand up, so I don't know if you want to come in, Mark. Hello. Yeah. Hi, yes, thank you. <clears throat> um, so I just thought it was a good opportunity to promote how Trust is actually involved with COVID um, and BME populations. Um, so the Trust hosts something called the Applied Arc, Applied Research Collaboration East Midlands, which is ARC, um, which is part of the NIHR infrastructure. And uh, Professor uh, Conti, who is the director of that, he actually leads on a BME programme of work across the country relating, uh, uh, sorry, around art, but he's very involved with um, the SAGE work at the moment. So I just thought it's a good opportunity to, to flag that as a trust, we're actually involved very heavily with uh, the work, that's, as in the leadership of, of work that's going right up to SAGE around that very uh, issue. Thank yeah, that, uh, thanks, Mark. Thanks for flagging that. That's that's a that's a that's a, that's a really good um, example of probably something that um, many of our staff aren't aware of. And there's there's a there's quite a significant infrastructure um, supporting that, isn't there? That, um, that uh, if you, if you look, if people want to look up, and you can Google it, um, and there's probably a link from Connect as well, um, ARC. Um, and there's, there is some really good um, BAME um, research um, links and also some really useful access to webinars as well if people are interested to follow that up. Good call, Mark. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, and the final question that's been that's uh, been sent in um, Oh, sorry, Yolanda has just added in response to that point. There are also some national BAME uh, staff virtual conferences about vaccinations this week and next week. We will share the links in John's daily message. Um, but and uh, Mark has then added the, the link on. So that's absolutely fantastic as well. 
Um, and then Julie has, has added in NHS Bassett Law CCG is looking at the future of mental health launched and engagement process to hear feedback on the proposals to develop community services and change the way mental health and dementia inpatient services for adults and older people are provided mental mental health unit the final decision will be made on the ccg once people's views have been considered alongside other information including the views of partner organizations and independent clinical advice and there's a link there for joining the conversation so julia do you, <laughs> do you want to say something a little bit better than i just did <laughs> thank you well, you picked up on my technical faux pas and because I pressed um, send too soon on that message. <laughs> so I did want to introduce the point that um, just to talk to people about Bassett Law for a few minutes. So um, uh, Bassett Law CCG are out for consultation about local community mental health services. Um, and this involves proposals around um, the, the potential to move um, B1 and B2 wards to Mansfield, but also included in the proposals are uh, the plan for the future community model, which does include um, quite a significant investment into Bassett Law Community Services um, in the region of three million pounds over three years uh, and 50 more staff. So I just um, just wanted to encourage colleagues, particularly those who live locally in Bassett Law, to um, to have their say really and uh, provide the link for that consultation. Apologies for my not very elaborate introduction and uh, impromptu posting. I'm just a technical, you know, I'm just full of technical errors this morning, this afternoon. Not at all. That's great. Thank you ever so much. Um, Catherine um, has added into the chat also about um, updates on BME COVID research study with ARC are in recent past editions of the CEO daily briefing and have been sent out in BME staff network as the dates for the BME COVID vaccine sessions, both network and briefing. Yes, BME staff network has just reached 255 members. Woohoo! That's awesome. So thank you very much for that, Catherine. That's great. Um, and just one um, one final um, message that um, sorry, one final question um, that was sent in. Um, I've received a shielding letter and have not been asked to shield previously. Um, it states that it's not mandatory, but is advisable. What should I do from a work perspective? John, I don't know if you wish to answer that. Do as you're told. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's not the right answer, is it? Sorry. Uh, that's the, fine if that's the, the answer. The answer I gave before, Anne-Marie said, well, that's just waffle. Um, <laughs> so what the, the right answer is, is that I, I think this has caused a, 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 a bit of confusion as it is. Really, it's a really good, um, it's a really good question because there'll be a number of people that um, have now received a shielding letter that for probably nearly a year haven't had a shielding letter and haven't shielded and they'll be thinking well this doesn't really make any sense. Um, but um, in the circumstances I think the right thing would be do, to do would be to if you if you've been told to shield shield but as it says it's not mandatory um, we will um, attempt on a, an individual person by person basis to have a conversation with you to um, discuss what your um, your role entails, um, what potential risks are, um, and then to come to an agreement as to what the best um, thing to do is. So um, one, don't worry, don't panic. Um, we'll go through them individually and, and work something through. Um, and have a flexible approach that um, minimises risk and um, uh, and hopefully um, keeps people safe and happy and content. Was that That's better, Anne Maria? So much better, Dr Bruin. So much better. I have got a couple of things that I would like to add at the end, Alex. If that's okay. That's exactly what I was just going to ask if anybody had anything else. I know that flu hasn't been mentioned yet, and Maria, so... I haven't mentioned flu. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I've got a couple, just a couple of bits. Um, as an as an executive, we're really keen to to help support know about any um, submissions for awards, uh, whether they be local, regional, or national awards. So I just wanted it's a bit of a plea, really. If if you're thinking about putting in for an award, it doesn't matter what it is. Um, just give us a heads up because we might be able to support you with the submission, but also it always looks really, really good if we're giving our backing to it as well, because that always gives you a bit of a tick in the box. So it was just to say, if you are putting anything in, let us know, brilliant. If you've been shortlisted, once again, let us know, we can celebrate. Um, and I know that we've got Yolanda on the call today, who's our new comms lead, and she's absolutely brilliant at this. And it's really like on celebrating and showcasing. So if you get shortlisted, even better. Um, and then if you get invited to a ceremony of any sort, again, it's something that we can really sort of like support you with, celebrate with you. Um, so I don't want you to keep it to yourself because it's trust wide acknowledgement of the fabulous work that you're doing. So that was my first plea. Um, the second one was, I've got to mention flu, you've all done really, really well. 83% we got to. Um, it closes on the end of February. Um, so there are still the ability to have a flu jab if you want to have it. Um, it'll be very interesting next year as to what happens. I don't know yet whether or not they'll apply a target. I don't know whether or not it'll be alongside the COVID booster. I, I, I genuinely don't know. So the more that we know, um, and as soon as we know, we'll let you know. But 83% fabulous. I just wanted to also let you know that I've talked about it a couple of times on things like this, is that we started a big project um, last summer around uniforms. Um, you all know that we started it. It was for two reasons. The first reason was um, it was very confusing. I was a new director of nursing. I couldn't make out what people were wearing. What it, what it denoted, what colours there were. There was no standardisation across the organisation at all. We had about 145 different uniforms. So that was one reason we started the project. And the second reason was when COVID hit in the March, a lot of you that didn't have uniforms asked for a uniform. And uh, procurement were amazing. They went out and bought us 10,000 polo shirts and uh, trousers for you to all to have that didn't have uniforms. I wanted to let you know that that work has, did not stop. We took it, we took it all serious. Um, we listened to what you all had to say um, and we've developed a really good project. Kamal Kai has led that. It's a fabulous piece of work, but it's coming to its conclusion now. So what we're going to do is work out some communication to get out to you through the month, month of March. So I just wanted to let you know that we hadn't forgotten. We were doing something with it. It's a good piece of work. You'll get some communication out on that. I wanted to also mention CQC. We had an unannounced inspection over a three day period at the end of January. And, um, and it was on the back of uh, what I would class as whistleblowing where somebody had said, a member of staff had said something and they felt the need to come in and have a look at, um, at, at the areas. Um, I suppose what I'm saying to you is, is that, you know, this could happen at any point, at any time to any area. Um, so it's also just to say not to be afraid of the CQC. I've been saying that to you, not to be afraid of them. They're there to support um, and it's actually to help us to understand how we can better ourselves and be the best that we could ever be as an organisation. So um, it's just really if they do come because they don't have to tell us, you see, so they don't have to give us any warning. So if they come and they turn up and it could be a weekend because the one that they did was a Saturday, they told they bowled up at 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, and we wouldn't know as you know, I wouldn't know. So just to say, don't be afraid. It's all right. But to, to work with them, show them around um, tell them, tell them what they're wanting to hear. You know, they'll ask you lots of questions. They'll want to talk to patients. So um, make sure that you really do the good hosting of it, because like I said, normally I would always give you a heads up and I would tell you all that it's going to happen. But on these, I don't get to know about it, so I can't tell you. So just just a bit of a heads up. Um, but as soon as it happens, you know, um, we're happy to be contacted immediately and then we'll support you through it. Um, and I also wanted to let you know is that um, the CQC and external bodies are really interested at the moment around number one, closed cultures. Um, so that's about how it feels uh, to be on the receiving end of the organisation, to work within the organisation, how it feels. 
And then the second thing that they're very interested in at the moment is a restrictive practice, seclusion, segregation, uh, restriction, anything that we're doing to patients, um, particularly in times of COVID, um, because there has been an increase. So they're very, very interested in those areas. We have recruited a trust wide lead, Emily Binding, um, and she's now been in post for about four weeks. Um, so she's our restricted practice lead for the trust. And I just wanted to let you know that it's a really good piece of work that we're doing and we're making sure that you're all included in any developments that come about. So those are the bits that I just wanted to mention. That's great. Thanks, Anne-Maria. That's really helpful. Um, is there anything that anybody else would um, like to say? There's a couple of things from um, Kumar, um, sorry, from Catherine, uh, um, one around Kumar. Um, when Kumar leaves in March, should take up his new associate director role. Woohoo! Well done, Kumar. That's fantastic. Um, he has to find a new member to replace him in, in um, with regards to numbers, and I think that's linked to the the um, BME staff network. So, um, and also Catherine's advised, um, just to remind everyone that our ICS LGBT plus History Month event led by NUH is 2 till 4 uh, p.m. today. So that's great. Thank you. Is there anything else that anybody would like to say? Good for me, good. thanks, Alex. Um, great, great questions. Uh, good session. Thanks for looking after us. Um, Thanks to everybody and have a good afternoon, everyone. Take care. Thank you ever so much. Thank Thanks. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.